Welcome back to The Charismatic Voice. Today we're diving into Slipknot's Psychosocial. And I feel like this is the perfect time to do this song because holy cow, there are a lot of social events right now. And it feels like there's just so much pressure to go and be on and be out there. And I know that this song is about so much more than that. So let's get to it. Gosh, uh, it's so amazing how even from the very, very beginning moment, it this makes my hair stand up somehow. Like the sounds, they don't feel like they're just sounds tickling my eardrums. It feels like they're eliciting a physical reaction. It's, it's just a, it's primal, visceral. I love the word of visceral. Actually, visceral is like the perfect word to describe Slipknot, by the way. Y'all, visceral, that's the word. We'll come back to that many times. And, and that's because, right, you think about viscera, they feel disturbed, they're rumbling in some way from the very, very get-go. I'm gonna go back and see if I can talk about what causes that in the sound to a degree, but I also think that this might be a futile mission because there is something that's just left to magic. We're gonna go back though, beginning, one more time. Okay, so part of what makes it uh, stand on edge all of a sudden is we had this this sort of almost noise come in that got bigger and louder and then a drop out of the sound and then everything hit the right side really hard. And it was it feels like the entire mix gets weighted to the right. It makes you feel off kilter. Back to the beginning one more time. Almost feels like I go deaf in my left ear for a second there. By the way, uh, I'm gonna be paying a lot of attention to how the sound is organized in space. And if you really wanna pay attention to that with me, uh, put on a great set of headphones, that's really amazing for all of the panning differences. Uh, you can also listen to this in some fantastic speakers and monitors. If you guys want recommendations on that, I do have some things listed in the about section. Um, lots of different resources you can use for that, but ultimately, Let's just try and pick out all of these details and whatever you've got handy. You can upgrade later if you feel like it. All right, there's that like moment. And when we have that initial sound starting off in the right, it almost feels like it's sort of in like a, an enclosed chamber. It feels very limited. And then when the other sounds come in, it suddenly brings us into this bigger space. I feel like I'm in a cathedral or maybe some large outdoor space then. It's almost uh, shifting realities. It's so... All right, a couple other things in there before we get to the vocals. We had these chromatic bits that were introduced, almost like if you think about Flight of the Bumblebee is a very famous, very chromatic classical piece. But these chromatics are hanging out really low. It does have that sensation almost of like a buzzing creature, this kind of thing that's happening because these pitches are so close together and it feels like they're going just up and down in these tiny incremental shifts in tone. And then uh, there's one other thing that I'll point out. Gosh. There is that first command that was there. 
And then there are these huge jumps that go up into a very distorted sound. So again, it all puts us off kilter. Like that. Like, wow. And more chromatics right there. Listening to Corey Taylor's vocals is just, uh, it is such a lesson for me. I've become very interested in harsh vocalizations, extreme vocalizations. They're called, both are called this when basically when you have some more distortion in the voice, like what he's doing. And become very interested in how these are created very interested in how we can teach this in a safe and healthy way. We know that at one point, Corey Taylor did some damage to his voice, for example. So like I listened to what things might be sustainable long-term versus maybe not. I also am listening for perhaps what physical structures he's engaging to create these sounds. So I'm gonna dive really deep into this in this video, but I want you all to know that as I'm talking about this, there is some science in this area. There's uh, there's some great camera footage out there of us putting a, a throat camera down Will Ramos's throat, but uh, there is not enough science. So I'm gonna talk about some of the things that we know, and I'm also gonna leave this open some because truth be told, there isn't a big final umbrella of this is this, this is this, no matter what, because we know a few case studies, but we haven't done a really wide swath of studying in this area of vocalization. So I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna start talking about it. Just keep in mind that everybody's voice still functions differently. If you're trying to recreate these sounds, you might actually come to them in a different way still. Gosh, the sound, like just from the outside in at first, this is such a good sound to express this pent up frustration and anger, right? I think that any kind of harsh vocals or distortion that are that's put onto vocals, I think it's excellent for expressing some very strong, often maybe not like pleasant feeling emotions. So uh, what, a great vocal expression that humans have available. I think that's amazing. One of the things I find fascinating is that he's essentially speaking on pitch. There's, it's sustained. And so it like, it, it goes into that idea of maybe singing, which would be like a sustained phonation. Um, now singing sustained phonation can sometimes be applied to harsh vocals too. We'll talk about that a little more later. He doesn't sound like he's necessarily going for a melody, though. It's There's a little more fuzziness about where that pitch center is sometimes. It doesn't sound like it's something I want to hum back. So I think that he's considering this from the point of view of a harsh sound first and then some sort of pitch underneath it. Now, physiologically, this happens in the opposite direction. There's a pitch first. That's where the two vocal folds vibrate. Okay, those create a pitch. So. Those happen, and then after that, there's different structures, different mechanics that can be engaged to create some sort of harsh sound on top. And uh, there have been times I think I heard the false chords at the beginning. It sounds like I'm getting what some people would call like a little fry on top of this, which is 
very different from Fry Register, y'all. Very, very mechanically different. Um, but it sounds like maybe some sort of upper constriction that is adding to that distorted sound on top. But again, it sounds like he's thinking about the, the distortion first and then the pitch. Like I said, Corey Taylor, huge lesson in harsh vocals. I'm gonna go back to the beginning and see if I can catch that moment where it sounds like uh, we've got like a, a really cool slide. Those chromatics, bug-like. Yeah, definitely, like, we're definitely sliding from a, a low pitch center up to a high one there. And it sounded like I got some false chord action in there, but I've also heard some people replicate a really low sound just using some upper constrictions. So I'll leave this open to what he might possibly be doing that could be very unique to his particular anatomy. So heavy. <laughs> I just, I love that the lyrics start with, I did my time. It makes you feel like somebody was in jail, right? But, uh, it's also this idea, I think, of like socialization and society as well. And so thinking about all of those gatherings that I mentioned in the intro of this, you go, whoa, I did my time. I went to that party. Oh, I was on there. Okay. <laughs> I know this is a little over-dramatization. Is that the word? Over-dramatization of that idea for me. But there have been times in life where I was just like, I really don't want to be social right now. And I know that there are many other people that feel that so much more keenly, more sharply than I do. So just, I wanna relate to y'all for a little bit here and possibly to the message of this song. One more time. I did my time. So effective as an opening lyric. Amazing. Okay, so I like actually having a little bit of pitch underneath the harsh sound. When we have just harsh sounds and we're getting a lot of variety in those harsh sounds, it can be really hard, really hard to get text. And that's partly because you get a lot of variation in harsh sounds for making like weird tongue positions, like putting your tongue behind your teeth or curling it up or switching it to the side, making some sort of tunnel scream, right? So when you have a little bit of pitch center to add to this as well, like meaning pitch from your true folds, not just pitch center from the harsh vocals. When you have that, I think that we get a little bit more clarity of the lyrics a little bit more easily because people are listening to the variation of the pitch uh, rather than just the variation of the center of sound and how it's manipulated with a weird tongue thing for a harsh vocal. Did that make sense? I tried to explain it as best I could. It's, it's a very confusing subject. Ultimately, a little bit more truefold action, I think is more clarity of lyrics, but I still missed one. Effusive. I thought he said abusive at first. I was like, wait, wait, did I catch that right? I did my time, I want out. So abusive is what I thought he said, and was so effusive. So this is a great example of it is just hard. No matter how little pitch you have in that harsh vocal, I think it's just very, very difficult to get words out with lots of clarity in any kind of harsh vocals. Back a little bit again, let's keep going. Effusive. I mean, that's like kind of catchy, huh? 
almost like poppy at moments in that chorus. There's a there's a definite desire that I have to sing along, and I that's the first time I've ever heard that chorus. So I'm, I'm like, whoa, that's it feels a, a little bit prettier than some other uh, of the Slipknot stuff I've heard. Oh, it's so interesting. It's so interesting. Ooh, okay, I'm going to go back one more time. There's So we have, again, this like pitch underneath the distortion that's happening in the first verse. This is one of the areas where I see some singers get into the most trouble with harsh vocals. And that is that they're trying to use the true vocal holds to create that harsh sound. And ultimately, you really want to be using other fleshy bits, again, higher in the vocal tract to make the harsh sounds. The true vocal folds, they're stratified and they're just constructed in a way that makes them really good at creating a pitch. They're, the tissue is different. And then as you go up the false vocal folds, the aryepiglottic folds, um, even when we talk about like our retinoids and rattle, there's all kinds of other things up above that have a different kind of makeup. And it makes them potentially more resistant to a ton of breath pressure just going smacka, smacka, smacka. And in this case, uh, it, it would be much better to make a noisy sound with those fleshy bits that are above and can take it versus these very, like, very specific made for pitch true vocal folds. So um, when you're listening to this beginning portion, one of the things I wonder, like if maybe Corey Taylor had in the past when he got into trouble, I wonder if maybe it was because he was making some more distortion, uh, distorted noises with the true vocal folds. I'm, I don't know. I don't know exactly what his troubles were. So hard to know in this case, but that is the number one situation where people will blow out their voices is when they try to make a harsh sound with their true vocal folds, which are not meant to do that. Go back. It's a thick sound. There's like just a tiny bit of Brandon Boyd in there, which is really nice. Okay, we'll keep going. Wow. Oh, there's our title. Whoa, that like almost like exit alarm sound that's in the background. Oh, like it's like a fire alarm is going off. <sighs> That's a really intense effect with the psychosocial being yelled over and over and over. Wow. Also, some of those harmonies in the chorus were just like, they were pretty. They were pretty. What is going on? This song feels so mixed up. Love. Love that quick slide that he does up from the bottom, the way it just drags us in there right away. Love it. Great layering. Wait, I think he was hitting a, like a gas can. There was a really, okay, I'm fine. Oh, ooh, ooh, okay. Sorry, so many things. Lots of details in this. I like the way that there's that quick slide up which draws us in and then we get the bottom of the sound dropped out. There's this like momentary drop of instruments and then we dive back in. It's like, it feels like a really bumpy roller coaster. Like we just jumped over a section that was missing in the track. <laughs> Yeah. 
That! Is that a keg? I think he's beating a keg. <laughs> That's so metal. <laughs> Nothing new, but when we kill it all, they was all we had. I also saw a timpani in the background. I hadn't been paying attention to that sound, but if that's there, that's amazing. I would love to see more timpani used in heavy metal and rock in general. I just think it's such a great, beefy sound. Why is it not used more? Who needs another mess? We could start over. Just look me in the eyes and say I'm wrong. Awesome. It is always a good sign when you have someone who's singing harsh vocals and they go into clean vocals right afterwards without any perceivable uh, roughness to the clean voice. That is a, a very great sign. So if you're practicing and you can flip back and forth between the two really without uh, experiencing that frustration of getting a clean tone right away, you're, you're on a good path. Okay, back once more. Also, it sounds like they have like a really cool instrument effect with this flame that I cut out halfway through. Oh my gosh, I love the way they put the music video fire effect to that sound. Oh, so good. I loved that guitar solo. Wow, it felt so free. It, it just ripped through everything and seemed like it was on fire. Like it, there was no stopping it from just raging. Wow, what a powerful solo. I wanna go back here. Yeah, I wanna hear the whole thing again. I like the fast vibrato. Just soaring. Wow. Are they trading it off to you? That's so awesome. And then I, I'm really glad that they did a clearing of the sound right afterwards because it was just so good. I don't know where you could go with it after that. Um, so we need a little bit of a rest for the ears with the next section. It's a great pick. were in that. Like, whoa. Gosh, I think I'm counting at least three. And I know, so we have Corey Taylor, but I'm getting to know the man. Okay, here. So I think, who else? We have Sean Crahan? Crayon? Cray like, Crayon? Anyhow, Sean is on backing vocals, and we also have Chris Fain on backing vocals. And I think Paul Gray, who's uh, passed away since, um, I I think maybe was backing vocals on this as well. That's amazing. Um, 
just shout out to backing vocalists there. I don't know if this was uh, multiple layers of Corey Taylor on Harsh or if we had multiple Harsh vocalists coming in. Uh, this was such a cool emotional moment. It feels terrified. It feels um, spine tingling. What I, I just, I stand in awe at the amount of emotions that a harsh vocal can elicit. This is incredible. There's, there's this thing I'm wondering about, okay. So a lot of times uh, doctors will recommend to people who are going through depression to go sing in choir. And it's well documented that if you sing in choir, people tend to be happier. They release, uh, there's hormones that are released while singing together with another person that helps you to trust them more. Uh, there's happy hormones that get released as well. So uh, singing in choir is legitimately a great prescription to help somebody battle depression. Now, I don't think there are choirs though with harsh vocals that have been studied on this. I think this is just clean singing. So I'm wondering now, what if we had just a choir of harsh vocalists? Is it gonna release the same kind of uh, hormones? Because <laughs> right, this is a very different kind of vocal expression. And if you have multiple screamers like this together, what happens then? Right. I said before, we haven't studied enough people. We haven't studied enough throats to really completely understand all these things that are happening. We understand a tiny bit. We haven't even begun to brush the surface of maybe what would happen in a harsh vocal choir. Oh my gosh. Subjects for the next paper. <sighs> What a great shot. <laughs> and they knew it was a great shot, so they, they went back to it over and over. I'm gonna go back one more time. By the way, I read that the burning of the masks was representative of this idea of like burning up the ego, essentially. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. <laughs> So the like stomach knots that are happening are related to the instruments on the bottom. I think I think we had a, a bass in there that was doing tons of pitch bend, maybe a guitar as well. There's like bah, bah, uh, just lots of bend slide, very uh very unspecific in fading of pitches essentially. And uh it, it feels at the same time very dissonant. My stomach is like just gets put into knots by all of that. Add that to the terribly spine tingling screams on top and also the emptiness that was established with just having the percussion in there so that these things that are so uh, not stomach not inducing, they stand out even more. They get even more weight. Oh gosh. <laughs> easier to understand the words when we have just the clean singing. Uh, there's a chance too, I think, when I first started listening to harsh vocals, I thought maybe I'll understand the words more as my ears get used to this sound. I definitely think that uh, our hearing is not just a physical thing that's happening. It's very much a psychological thing as we hone in 
on little tiny minute differences in sounds, which add up to enunciation. But uh, in this in this case, as I've I've listened to it intensely for quite some time now, I can definitely pick up lyrics and harsh vocals better than I used to. But I still think that it is easier in clean vocals to hear the the lyrics with just a certain sort of clarity that becomes effortless in my listening to pick the lyrics up. Um, that doesn't mean that one is better or worse than the other, by the way. That's just an observation. I think we have to all stand back and say, maybe you actually want the listener to intensely listen and try to figure out what those lyrics are and maybe even misapply them so that it applies to the particular listener. All kinds of possible loopholes to go down here in our brains. Anyhow, going back, gonna keep playing. I like this line. I'm not the only one. So it feels like a lot of this, there's it's discussing isolation and a lot of inner turmoils. Maybe not just inner too. Uh, but then I like this phrase afterwards. I'm not the only one. I like the way that Slipknot is essentially able to relate to so many fans in that moment. There's tons of struggles people can be going through and saying, I'm not the only one. Basically, you and I could be going through the same awful stuff together, right? This is, I feel that there's so much power in just recognizing the shared human condition. Beautiful. Right, it feels like our harmony is a little bit more back to that uh, functional, traditional, not a totally common chord pattern, okay? We don't have our, our four chord kind of song going on right now. Um, but it is, it, it feels more standard in harmony than we get, honestly, a very sticky kind of melody happening here. And I think that's interesting that it comes along with these lyrics of, and the rain will kill us all. Again, it's a, it's an us kind of statement. We're bringing it all into us. And I see lots of we here. Um, but it's interesting. I like this, but no one else can see the preservation of the martyr in me. So it's this idea like we're together, we're together, but then there's even in that togetherness, there's an isolation that is in the lyrics. Layers on layers and layers. We're like definitely ogres here, right? Shrek reference. I'm not, not saying, it. okay. We are ogres. Gosh, gosh, I like the way that they took this abandoned kind of energy in the chorus and then just funneled it into this sort of disrepair all of a sudden. It's like, ah, oh, we're going back into a tornado here, guys. No one else can see the of the modern man. <laughs> Jump up to big distortion. I'm getting total Lorna Shore vibes right there. Just saying, I, it's it's happening. Uh, I bet this had some inspiration. Um, anyhow, to the hellfire. Yes. <laughs> I, I think that this song, I like taking that word visceral from before. And I'm continuously feeling like we're in this sort of swirling storm in this song. And there's moments when you're in the eye of the storm and you have that sort of melody. It feels a little bit 
calmer, like a little clearer in a lot of ways, but then you just get swept back in. So I'm gonna call this a visceral storm. Visceral musical storm. Ugh. That might be the end. It's so shocking. We have this picture of shattering glass and the sound completely cut out. One of the loudest, most abrasive sounds that you can think of in real life, the shattering of glass is silent here. Whoa, crazy. Uh, I also, I was hit by the fact that it's been so fiery and then all, as the video has gone on more and more, we've had this uh, water introduced. And I think maybe that's calling back to the rain will kill us all. That idea of the, the, it's drenching maybe this fire inside. So many layers once again, back a little bit. Yes! Yeah, spine tingles all over. That's so powerful. That is such an intense experience. I don't understand how people can be in a concert for hours with this kind of sound and like still survive. It is just so intense physically, emotionally, orally, of course, all of those things. Wow, crazy, crazy. Maybe someday I'll get to experience this live. But uh, until then, I'll still be here analyzing lots of music on YouTube. And if you want to check out some more analysis of some very intense songs, you can check out this playlist over here. May you fall more in love with music every day.